Following World War II, the United States military greatly expanded efforts to harness the power of the atom. Military planners were enamored with the promise of cheap, long-term power offered by a nuclear reactor, and efforts were in full swing in the 1950s to develop nuclear reactors to support the military. Before satellites were available to monitor for impending attack, radar stations were placed in locations that were thought most likely routes for Soviet nuclear missiles. The distance early warning, Dew Line, was a line of radar outposts across the Arctic and Alaska in Canada, where radar operators would watch 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for incoming ballistic missiles. These outposts were maintained by regularly flying fuel and supplies to the outposts to generate electricity and heat. Perhaps it goes without saying that this was seriously expensive, and the US military was very interested in a cheaper alternative, and so looked to nuclear reactors. A series of reactors were envisioned, some mobile, to be identified as M-type reactors, some stationary, designated as S-type, at a variety of power levels, L for low, M for medium, H for high. One of the first of these reactors to be developed was the SL-1 reactor, S for stationary, L for low power, and 1 because it was the first of this type. The intended purpose of this particular reactor was to provide heat and electricity to radar monitoring stations along the dew line. The reactors were designed to take advantage of local materials for shielding wherever possible, and were also designed such that the pieces, when disassembled, could be easily transported to the location where they would be set up and operated. This meant that the large concrete structures used to safely contain modern reactor vessels would have been too heavy and too costly to build, so a simple steel building was erected to protect the reactor components from the elements. The hope was that the soldiers with a minimal amount of training would be able to operate and maintain these reactors with a minimum amount of support, enabling them to be operational for up to three years without refueling. The SL-1 reactor design was flawed in many ways. As an example, thin boron sheets were attached to the outside of the control rod blades to provide better control of the fission process in the reactor. In the core of the reactor, boron is converted into carbon-14, and this tended to cause the boron sheets to deform and eventually flake off, causing the control rods to stick and hang up periodically in the reactor core. Another more fundamental design flaw was the ability for the reactor to achieve criticality with the actuation of only one of the control rods. Criticality in a reactor is the condition where it supports a sustained nuclear fission reaction and can generate power. On the SL-1 reactor, if the central control rod were withdrawn, criticality could be achieved, even with the other control rods fully inserted. As a result of this reactor accident, most reactors are required to be designed in such a way that the withdrawal of any single control rod cannot cause the reactor to become critical. The SL-1 reactor went critical, i.e. caused sustained nuclear fission for the first time, in August 1958 and was then used to produce power and to train reactor operators. Soldiers who wanted to become reactor operators were given nine months of initial training in Fort Belvoir in Virginia before heading out to the desert in eastern Idaho for an additional six weeks of classroom training before training with a senior reactor operator crew operating the SL-1 reactor. The reactor was operated by a crew of two to three people, and maintenance was typically conducted by the same two to three man reactor crew, in keeping with the goal of the reactor development program to have a reactor that could be operated and maintained with minimal support in a remote area. During the day shift in Idaho, a health physicist was typically also on hand to monitor the radiation exposure of the crew. On December 23, 1960, the SL-1 reactor was shut down in preparation for the Christmas holiday, after which crews began to conduct scheduled maintenance to prepare the reactor to resume normal operation. On January 3, 1961, the night shift took over maintenance operations on the reactor from the day shift. This included two Army men, John A. Jack Bynes, the senior reactor operator, and Richard L. McKinley, a trainee, and a Navy man, Richard C. Dick Legg, the assistant operator and shift supervisor. For the most part, the men on the shift were competent and unremarkable among the other trainee reactor operators in their class. Several interesting things emerged after the accident in relation to the men involved, however. Jack Barnes, for example, worked part-time at a gas station, filling cars with gas, topping up tires, and cleaning windows. While Barnes didn't invent the side hustle, this has to be one of the more interesting pairings of all time. Nuclear reactor operator by day, pump jockey by night. Barnes was also having some sort of marital trouble, and it is known that Barnes's wife called the reactor building a few times on the night of the accident, although whether this played into the events on the night of the accident is unknown, as is the substance of their discussion. After the accident, it also came to light that Dick Legg was also known as a prankster. Among his many pranks, he reportedly once turned off a fan used to cool a specific reactor instrument, causing the system to alarm. After nearly sending everyone on the shift into a panic, Legg coolly reached around to the back of the control panel and switched the fan back on. 
<laughs> Jesus, that is a prank and a half, isn't it? These were the men preparing the reactor for operation the night of January the 3rd, 1961. Part of the maintenance conducted during the shutdown of the reactor required that the control rods be disconnected from the control rod drive mechanisms. Under normal operations, these mechanisms would lift and lower the control rods to increase or decrease the power output of the nuclear reactor core, which would in turn cause more or less steam to be generated. This steam would then power turbine generators for electrical power and heat for the reactor building. On the night of January the 3rd, 1961, the men were working to reattach the control rods to the drive mechanisms. When the central control rod was disconnected, a C-clamp was attached at the level of the floor above the reactor to support the weight of the control rod while the control rod drive mechanism was disconnected. To reconnect it, one man had to lift the roughly 85-pound control rod off the supporting C-clamp so another man could remove the clamp. To enable the control rod to be lifted, a handle was attached in the place of the control rod drive mechanism. At 9.01 p.m. on the night of January the 3rd, 1961, Jack Byrnes was lifting the control rod. Dick Legg was crouching next to him, ready to remove the C-clamp, and Richard McKinley was standing a short distance away, holding a cutie pie radiation instrument to monitor radiation exposure levels. The procedure called for the control rod to be lifted no more than two inches to disconnect the clamp. Subsequent investigations showed that the control rod was lifted 20 inches or more out of the core. This caused the power level in the reactor to rise extremely quickly, a condition referred to as prompt criticality, and within fractions of a second, much of the fuel had melted and a large amount of steam was formed. This steam explosion then caused the large layer of cooler water above the reactor core to accelerate upwards and slam into the underside of the reactor vessel head. The reactor vessel then jumped, shearing the piping and instrumentation connected to it, to dislodging shield blocks and eventually hitting the ceiling of the reactor building. All three men died as a result of this accident. It is believed that Bynes and Leg died immediately, and McKinley may have survived until shortly after he was recovered from the reactor building and is thought to have died in the ambulance within hours of the accident, although this is not clear. At any rate, he never regained consciousness. The three men were the only witnesses to what actually caused the accident. This left everyone wondering what could have caused Bynes to pull the central control rod out so far. Initially, there was some concern that this may have happened out of ignorance of the danger of pulling the central control rod. However, investigation found that the reactor operators had conversations where they discussed that in the event of an advancing Soviet army, they would likely just go pull the central control rod to blow up the reactor, so it is unlikely, although not impossible, that the men were ignorant of the danger. Speculation ranged far and wide as to the cause of the accident, from a stuck control rod to showing off to horseplay, and even included a theory that it was a murder-suicide. In the aftermath of the accident, the US government made a considerable effort to understand what had happened. One of the more amusing, although tragic, theories was related to Dick Legg's pension for horseplay and pranks. Someone, the real hero of the story, theorized that perhaps as Bynes began to lift the control rod, Legg may have goosed him, causing him to jerk the control rod upwards in surprise. Let's call this the atomic goosing theory. A less thorough investigating team may have dismissed this as a remote possibility that warranted no further thought, but I think we're all grateful to know that the investigators in this case were very, very thorough. The investigating team built a mock-up of the top of the reactor, complete with properly weighted control rods. Subjects and researchers took turns pulling up the control rod to first determine if it was physically possible for a person to pull the rod fast enough to cause the prompt criticality condition. After determining that it was indeed possible, they then attempted to test the atomic goosing theory. For the uninitiated, Merriam-Webster defines this type of goose as to touch or pinch someone on the buttocks. If you think through what the goal of the testing is, a few things become clear. First, the subject who is lifting the rod can't be expecting the goose. You can't be surprised by a goose if you know it's coming. This seems to imply that the subjects likely didn't consent to the goosing beforehand. One can only speculate on what the subjects were told and how things were explained afterwards. Second, the nature of the goosing could play a role in the response of the subject to said stimulus. Given this, we can only assume that somewhere deep buried in the government archives there exists a procedure for delivering the appropriate goose, perhaps with diagrams, maybe a step-by-step -step process, perhaps even calibration jigs and necessary training to perform the correct goose. Even if such a document doesn't exist, we can all rest comfortably with the assurance that US tax dollars were once used to goose people for science. What we actually know of this testing is largely from interviews with 
C. Wayne Bills, who was the deputy director of health and safety at the Idaho site at the time of the accident. He describes the subsequent testing as including a sudden release of the rod while someone pulled it up, simulating the stuck rod condition, as well as someone sneaking up behind the person and lifting the rod and poking them in their sensitive areas. He notes that none of the tests caused those doing the lifting to inadvertently pull the central control rod more than a few inches, let alone the 20 or more that led to the accident. The official conclusions of the investigative team were that we don't know what led to Byrne's pulling the control rod out of the core. In the aftermath of the accident, it was necessary to properly dispose of the now destroyed and highly contaminated reactor and components. In keeping with the mindset of the 50s and early 60s, they made this a problem for future generations. Much of the contaminated reactor building and components were buried in the desert in eastern Idaho, not far from where the reactor was constructed and operated. The bodies of the three men were unfortunately extremely radioactive following the incident. This was largely due to small particles of radioactive materials that became embedded under the skin and elsewhere in the men's bodies as a result of the steam explosion and melted nuclear fuel. With radioactive materials embedded in their bodies, it was not possible to wash it off, and so autopsies had to be conducted from behind thick lead walls using makeshift tools attached to the ends of 10-foot-long handles. Afterwards, caskets had to be brought to the desert site machine shops and lined with lead prior to the funerals to protect mourners from receiving a high dose of radiation. Whether you are for or against nuclear power, it has to be recognized that this accident, while tragic, played a part in the safety of modern nuclear reactors, and perhaps we can all smile at the time that the US government goosed people for science. And now for a bonus fact. There wasn't actually any marketing firm behind the name of the Cutie Pie handheld radiation detector, even though it sounds like exactly the sort of radiation monitor used by the My Little Ponies, or something that would come in a strawberry shortcake nuclear reactor playset. It turns out that the name was given to this type of meter in a now declassified Atomic Energy Commission paper from September the 22nd, 1945, near the end of the Manhattan Project. This paper details the construction of the Cutie Pie radiation detector. In that document, the device is described as containing a circuit that was as simple as possible, yet sensitive for radiation work. It also states that they named it Cutie Pie because of its diminutive size. Perhaps the proper way to hold it at fancy tea parties or high-class nuclear reactor functions was with the pinky extended, although no mention of this appears in the AEC paper. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos. And as always, I'll see you next time.